she works at a hotel and she is All right, Mr. Carbone, I'm back and I'm me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you, Jim, for being with us. My yes. Pleasure. My pleasure. <clears throat> Give my best to that loyal Yankee supporter, Cindy Bigelow. I will. I we could we 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 could have used her bat. We could have used her bat a few times during the course of the series. Um, I'm sure. When I was a little bit younger, I used to have beer during Yankee games. Now I drink Bigelow tea. A better option, Joe. A better, a better option. option. A healthier one too, Joe. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, there was a time, a number of years, in which you know Joe Torrey was part of uh, the advertising campaign, right? He was. Yeah. He was, and I got to be honest with you. Uh, when you have a high Q rating, the the, the, the pay is good and the work is easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think you, you, you get a bucket full of money, Joe, to, to film a commercial or two. It's, right, I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. So I know we still have a few folks joining us, but I think what I'd like to do is is get us underway, if that's okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Long from The Workplace, and thank you for making time this morning to help us celebrate National Apprenticeship Week. I'm going to ask everyone, if you haven't done so already, to please mute yourselves. Um, feel free to leave your cameras on. It's always nice when people are speaking to be able to see the faces on the other side that they're speaking to. So please feel free to leave your cameras on if possible. Um, this week, as you may have noticed or seen a heightened presence on our social media platforms and new information our American Job Centers about apprenticeships. This morning, we want to carve out some time to talk about what we're doing to support apprenticeships, consider what else might be possible, and recognize the wonderful partnerships that create the successes that we're going to see. Um, this morning, we're going to share some stories and videos. We're going to ask for your input and we're gonna hear from employers that make the apprenticeships possible. And I, I just wanna take a step back just so everybody understands what we're talking about for apprenticeships. Uh, apprenticeship is an industry-driven, high-quality career pathway where employers can develop and prepare their future workforce, and individuals can obtain the paid work experience, classroom instruction, and a portable, nationally recognized credential. And to put that in perspective, 93% nationally of apprentices who complete an apprenticeship retain employment. And they do so with an average national wage of $77,000 a year. So that's uh, nice. I can give you a lot more statistics, but what I'd like to show is uh, share with you a quick video. And, uh, and let me show you what you think could be possible. And this is, are you ready for a new career? I like that, Shannon, if you pop that up. When you're ready, you're ready. And with an apprenticeship, you can get started in the career you're planning for without a two to four year wait. Gaining skills, unleashing your potential in top fields like advanced manufacturing, graphic design, and financial services. Discover apprenticeship because your plan is action. Get started at apprenticeship.gov. Your plan is action. That's one of the, the, the things that we're moving forward here with apprenticeships and growing them into manufacturing and hopefully into other industries. And it's made possible by uh, Louis Reyes, who's our director of Apprenticeship Works. And he's going to talk to you a little bit about Apprenticeship Works. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about Louis. He came to the workplace in the summer of 2021 as a trainer for the apprenticeship program. Previously, he was a master trainer at the Industrial Management and Training Institute. He was a vice president of operations for a touchscreen technology company and has worked as a project manager for Honeywell. He holds a master's in science in manufacturing engineering from New York University. And the one thing you 
get from Louis is you understand he's got a lot of energy. And to that end, he is an avid runner. Uh, he and I have had a number of conversations about marathons and long distance running, and he's got the energy to keep our programs going. So I'd like to turn over to Louis for a few words about Apprenticeship Works. Thank you, Tom. Thanks a lot. Great intro, great lead in. Um, um, awesome to be with everyone today. Again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is an exciting time for us, an exciting week. So I'd like to um, just share with you what we do at Apprenticeship Works and give you a nice little overview. And, and again, we are excited, to, you know, not only for us, for our, our employer partners and the participants we serve. So it's really an awesome week. And, and we have uh, made incredible inroads and, and are impacting industry at every turn. So we're excited about that. But um, as Tom was indicating, uh, I'll you know, give you some background on apprenticeships. And what we do here, we provide uh, training to address the shortage of skilled workers in manufacturing, healthcare sectors, and prepare uh, them to enter apprenticeships and employment. And what we do and what I get excited about this is not a job, this is a career. And I stress that every day I speak to, to uh, folks and I give presentations. We wanna give everyone a career and a pathway to not only change their lives, but uh, their families' lives. So that's, that's um, an exciting thing we do. So the, so the program creates pipelines for high school students and adults. Trainees receive access to career coaching, exploration, workforce, uh, readiness training, resume, interview, job search assistance, occupational training, certification, and again, supportive services and at no cost. Um, so th that is um, amazing that we can provide all of this at no cost. And, and we have, again, uh, um, we have incredible stories of success and we get really excited. I get really excited because that's, that's Tom was saying, I'm excitable kind of guy, high octane, and and that's what um, I, I love about uh, not only the space and apprenticeships, and and so it's exciting. So in manufacturing, we offer introduction to manufacturing. It's a uh, eight to ten week program, and then we also offer an introduction to manufacturing for in school youth. It's about fourteen weeks. And then we also uh, have introduction to CNC machine one training, which again, it's about 18, uh, I mean, eight to 10 weeks. And in there we have a boot camp, a readiness boot camp to prepare them properly to go into the training and, and to be uh, confident that they will succeed. And in addition to that, we have healthcare as well, community healthcare worker in youth and adults, 10 weeks, peer recovery specialists, adults, six weeks, and patient care technician in, in school youth and adults, 17 weeks. So we're covering a lot of ground, we're expanding, we're adding um, uh, other uh, uh, you know, best practices. So um, I, I um, get excited when I talk to people and we got something going with Stanford High School that we're going to be launching uh, next, uh, next year. So all exciting stuff. So again, welcome everyone and thank you for for joining us today. This is an exciting, not, not only exciting day for us, but an exciting week. And, uh, you know, we have some incredible uh, people that will uh, be providing additional input and background and all that. So thanks again and enjoy. Thank you so much, Louis. Appreciate that. And as Louis just let you know, a lot of the work that we're doing, which is great to hear about. Um, but again, we're talking about careers. We're talking about changing people's lives through the work that we do. And I'd like to share with you a quick story, if I can, from Quinn Hayes, who is one of the participants that has come through our programs. Hi, my name is Quinn Hayes, and I work at Horberg Industries in Bridgeport. Um, before I was offered an apprenticeship, I was working towards going to um, Sacred Heart or Pierre because I wanted to major in art. Um, I didn't have any scholarships or anything, so I was planning to pay um, out of pocket or with like financial aid. Um, but before I even got to apply for any of that stuff, um, I got offered an apprenticeship junior year um, with Jason, and Felicia, and all of them. Um, and that same year, that's when we started working um, 
downstairs in the high school, Derby High School, because that's when they put all the machines down there when they partnership with Housatonic, and that's when I started my apprenticeship. And I learned pretty much like all things manufacturing. Um, we start off with the basics, like how to use a machine, how to set up a machine. Um, you have to learn a lot of algebra, a lot of um, math, and like everything when it comes down to like inspection and like um, quality of like parts. Like I learned a lot of things in those um, two years in high school before I moved to the um, Lusitonic in person and then learned more and completed my um, like my bachelor's degree. Now I, um, after I finished Tusitonic in May, I've been working at Hordberg ever since then, so it's about to be a full year, half a year. Um, there I do almost the same thing. I just set up a machine, um, learn how to make quality parts there. Um, it never gets old either. You learn something new all the time. Like you, you never can make a perfect part, so you have to learn new things all the time. And um, that's what I do now, and that's what I learned. That's what I do learn from um, the apprenticeship. I think it's important because if you really stop, like we're just gonna have robots making our parts, and then no one's ever gonna want to like make parts again or like be creative and invent new things. A lot of inventions came out of manufacturing, so I think that's important. One of the things I really liked about what she said was about being cre creative and inventing new things. Um, that kind of is a great segue introducing our, our next speaker is Joe Carbone, President and CEO of The Workplace. You may not know, but he frequently tells people to take time to think, to dream, to imagine what could be. Uh, Joe instills an understanding of that in all the workplace employees that we are more about careers than we are about jobs. We empower individuals, foster self-sufficiency, and a show like say, restores hope. Joe's about building the partnerships that are so important for programs like apprenticeships and helping people overcome barriers. And I wanna invite Joe to, to say a few words about the importance of apprenticeships here at the workplace. Thank you, Tom. And uh, Tom is the guy that arranged the agenda for today. And let me just say that Quinn's a tough act to follow, isn't she? But her words, her comments are so typical of people that go through the apprenticeship operations. Um, they find themselves and they find their place in the regional economy. They learn something. And what's nice about apprenticeship is that the learning process is never really over. That as industries change, as technology changes, as business kinds of decisions change, they have to reform, they have to add to their credentials, they have to learn. So when we think of many years ago, lifelong learning was just a cliche, it has an application here. I don't know of a single apprentice who can say, okay, I've reached the point where I've, I've got the license now and I'm okay. And if they do nothing for five years or 10 years, they can become obsolete. But once they have it, and they're working somewhere, then it encourages the investment on the part of the employers. Let me first of all, welcome all of you to be here today. We're, we're grateful to be in a position to celebrate Apprenticeship Week. Uh, it's a program that's very important to us for a number of reasons, but not, not least among them is one must recognize the Connecticut economy right now. I mean, who would have ever imagined? I've been over 25 years at the workplace. I never thought in my life I would see a day in which there were more jobs posted than there are people unemployed, and all happening at a time when Connecticut is at full employment. I mean, full employment used to be 6% when I was in college. Nowadays, you can make a great case that it's 4.2, 4.3, all right? We are there, and we have been there for a while, and there's no sign that it's going to change. But what it does do is this, it says to people, well, first of all, it will say to the workplace very clearly, if you're about careers, all right, what is a career? What does it mean to the employer? Well, let me tell you what it means. Employers interview lots of folks before they make the hire. You need to come to an employer. You need to be prepared and you need to be credentialed. You need to have something so that an employer can take a risk. 
can hire you and give you a chance to demonstrate that you can do that job as well as anybody else. And all the learning process you have had have manifested itself into a highly skilled individual. Every time you succeed at that, every time you do, that's about as great of a, I think, a definition of a career as we're ever going to find. It's not just the amount of money that you're on the average you might earn. That's important, but that's not it. It's that you've got a credential. You've got something that's going to be the lead in your life to continuous learning. And that means this pathway to middle-class America, and I guess in a much more fundamental way, what I tried to bring to the workplace when I came here 25 years ago, I'm an, an, an economics guy that believes in the power of the middle class. That is what is good for everyone, those who are rich and those who are not, because those who are not are given the stepping stones to be in a position where you can be on a pathway to middle-class America. That's what apprenticeship does. It gives you that credential. And it says to an employer that you've been tested. You're motivated, all right? You're smart in your own area. That, that is what employers want. Now, get back to Connecticut for a second. We have had um, virtually no population growth for more than a decade. We know we are, our state is the sixth oldest average age in the entire nation. And we know we don't have a great record of retaining our kids after they graduate. So what does that mean? What's going to take the place? How is Connecticut going to be competitive? Well, the one thing we can do is that we can be smart. We can compete with just being smart, being able to move from one era of development to another uh, in a seamless way. So that as the industry changes, as the line of production or line of service changes, you're capable, you're ready to move with it. Now that's what brought the workplace a few years ago to a point where we applied for a federal grant involving youth, involving manufacturing. But it was one of only 14 or 15 federal grants issued in that round. And we've had money from the state of Connecticut, the great department of labor. And I have the pleasure of introducing the, the apprenticeship uh, the director shortly, but we had the resources in place and we still do. We have the resources in place. Now I want you to know that we're watching things very, very carefully because I'm sure there's a designation for additional funding for apprenticeship operations for the workplace. Hopefully in the near future, as need arises, we're gonna have the resources to make sure that we can respond. This is what our economy needs. This is what our businesses needs. And we have so many business leaders that are here today and I'm grateful to all of you because you've given folks a chance to kind of demonstrate the importance of the whole technology, uh, the whole discipline of apprenticeship and a record of success. So I am, I am grateful to all of you and again, I cite the business folks that are here, the young participants, the folks who are the educators that are here, uh, and Marsha Proto from the nursing establishment is here as well. Um, we've got some great plans, some great things to do. And in terms of burning off energy, Louie is a marathon runner, as, as Tom pointed out. I mean, he can do 20 miles and nothing. And, and, and his enthusiasm for his job is such that I'm glad he can do a marathon. I can't do marathons, but you can. And we're going to keep that pace up as time goes on. Now, there is and there always has been a director of apprenticeship operations for the state of Connecticut. And that person works within the office of the Department of Labor. Uh, it's an institution to itself. There's federal regs, there's state regs. I mean, you just can't declare an apprenticeship, right? Very strict kinds of guidelines. So the gentleman I'm going to introduce to you, um, Todd is, is, is a, kind of a longtime friend. I've known him for many years, and uh, he's had my respect for his, his qualifications for the job and the way in which he administers it. It's not an easy job. It's not like anything. 
when you walk into an American job center, our job is to uh, is to be sure you've got adequate training so that you can move from that position into something else. Apprenticeship has got kind of regulations, could be federal, could be state. There is, it's different. And it, and, it, and, it, and it takes a director at the state level, someone who is knowledgeable of all that, someone who is gonna deliver for the customer, which is the individual and the businesses, and also protect the interest of our state. We in Connecticut are fortunate that we've got somebody with sufficient experience and knowledge that he can walk that fine line and everybody can know whether you're a business looking for an apprentice or you're an apprentice looking for a program, that maximum benefit from the state of Connecticut and for the state of Connecticut is gonna be administered through a person who's not just knowledgeable, but caring, caring and appreciates the power of apprenticeship. So we in Connecticut are so fortunate, and I've done this before. In fact, at a dinner celebrating apprenticeship just a few weeks ago, uh, Todd could not make it, wasn't there, but if no one told you, Todd, I said, if you look at the apprenticeship operations in all 50 states, uh, we are where we are with the support of the Department of Labor and Todd Birch. And I'm proud to call him my friend, and tell you as a lifelong resident of Connecticut, I'm glad he's in charge. He is for the customer, be it business and individual, and he's also protecting the state of Connecticut interest. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the State Apprenticeship Director, Todd Birch. Good morning, Joan. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's hard to follow such a humbled, and I'm very humbled uh, for that introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, my good friend. Um, well, again, good morning, everybody. They were right in the middle of uh, National Apprenticeship Week, the 85th National Apprenticeship Week, uh, designated by the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, apprenticeships as a law started here in the, in the state of Connecticut um, with William Fitzgerald, Congressman Fitzgerald of the second district in his first term was able to pass a National Apprenticeship Act, protecting at that time, young individuals in the workplace for safety. We have well expanded upon that. We're very proud uh, to be the home of the National Apprenticeship Law. Uh, I take liberty, and Joe, as you, you just mentioned, <clears throat> lifelong learning. I'm a lifelong apprentice. Uh, I've gone through three or four different apprenticeships in my, my career, licensed as an individual, became a contractor, gone through a bunch of things, and now I'm also very proudly on behalf of the state of Connecticut uh, as being the Connecticut State Director also president of the National Apprenticeship Directors Association throughout the country, representing 33 states and territories, hundreds of thousands of employers and millions of apprentices with our good partners at the Office of Apprenticeship nationally. So as you stated, Joe, earlier, and for the businesses that are uh, on the line today, I am very employer-centric. Absent an employer, apprenticeship is nothing more than a concept. There are a lot of preparations, which our good partners on the line are uh, party to, uh, called pre-apprenticeship. That is a pathway into registered apprenticeship. And I want to be very clear. Apprenticeship is a post-hire workforce development employer's onboarding system. Very clear about that, post-hire. There has been, for many years, a lot of training and praying type of models. This is a training and, and placing type of model with a pre-apprenticeship uh, programs that we have in all industries. And Joe, you're very partnered to that as well. So again, the advantages for employers, I mean, people at employers specifically, and I wanna talk again to employers and Joe, thank you for pointing out the regulations. On behalf of the Department of Labor and Commissioner Bartolomeo and Deputy Commissioner Pazella, I have a pen and that pen I have learned over the years is mightier than the sword. I wanna work with employers for you to be able to create a program of onboarding, codify it for expectation purposes. Everybody's looking for work as Joe had mentioned before that are looking for workers. There are many people that are looking for work in different opportunities. There's no question about that. For many, many years, and our good friends and partners at Derby High School, um, they brought back shop. It used to be called they industrial. Call industrial. Now it's called career technical education. They give all these fancy names to it. We're getting back to our roots. Our roots are we have always, always manufactured great products here in the state of Connecticut. We make things that fly. We make things that go under the water. We are also the home to the wiffle ball. We are a manufacturing state, always will be. 
always will be. That being said, the advantages for employers, the recruitment of new employees, skilled or entry level, assuring that your new employees will be trained in the specifics of their new role post-hire developed by you and my staff. Implementing, implementing a codified and documented program that measures job-specific skill attainment in order for these new employees is what we call the bridge to professional practice. In, or, in order for an individual that comes right through your doors as a new employee to become proficient in their new role, which by the way, garnishes um, uh, higher employee retention due to the fact that they are loyal. You gave them a shot, as Joe had mentioned before. And if you give somebody a shot and teach them, they're gonna be with you for a very long time. I wanna talk about secession. We talk about the silver tsunami and for the hair that's still staying in my head is turning gray. So I kind of get that. <laughs> Knowledge transfer of occupational skills from highly experienced employees to the new individual, to your company or occupation via mentorship is the assistance for secession planning. These people have had vast knowledge and need to be stowed upon the new people that are walking in the door. So for an employer, again, you know, the return on investment is about $1.47 to your investment. First of all, you're getting a new employee and you're getting them to perform their task and their occupation the way you want them to perform. So what are the advantages for the apprentices? Again, apprentice is not just a pathway, it's a career. You're a paid employee. Upon completion of your apprenticeship, or again, becoming proficient in your occupation, you have mastered your industry-specific skills, your occupational proficiency, a workplace efficiency to be successful in that career. And again, lifelong learning, next steps. People may go down the road of various aspects of what they may get into next. And anyway, I call it the five tenets of registered apprenticeship. Again, first, direct industry involvement. You're an employer, absent an employer, no such thing, just a concept. You drive the bus here. You have to think about sometimes, it's just a recommendation, I should say. What do I do with a person when I bring them in the door? Do I go have them work with John or with Sally and have them show the ropes, so to speak? Registered apprenticeship pro program is nothing more than a codified list of attainment uh, skills to be uh, to attain over a period of time, plain and simple. Structured on the job learning. Again, that's that task list. What do you need to become proficient in over time? Again, determined by the employer. Related instruction. The theoretical aspects of the occupation. Okay, what does that mean? STEM education is fantastic, but contextualized instruction and learning with related instruction in STEM is the way to become proficient in your occupation, understanding that, okay, what is this trigonometry? What's this algebra? And how's it gonna work, you know, translate to the world of work? Specifically in manufacturing, as uh, the, the video had stated before from Quinn, putting that algebra together with manufacturing. If you can't do it, you cannot be an employee. Progressive wage increase, that's built into a registered apprenticeship program. You start as an apprentice learning the skills, getting better at your job, getting better at your career, getting better for the bottom line for your employers. They get a, they get a raise determined by the employer. And as was mentioned before, a national industry recognized credential. We've also been, we're the antithesis of the college system. There's no question about that. Every graduate of a registered apprenticeship program receives a national industry recognized credential issued by our office as a certificate of completion. So instances it takes two or, year, or four years to, to actually complete these uh, apprenticeships. It takes two years for an associate's degree and four years for a baccalaureate. Same amount of time. The difference is the majority of my apprentices have not occurred, uh, incurred any debt They've actually made money over the last four years or two years. I was quoted in the Connecticut Mirror, and I'm very humbled about that. When you graduate from college, you have a degree. When you graduate from a registered apprenticeship program, you have your career. So that being said, I, I thank everybody today for the partnership, the pre-apprenticeship work that we we're doing to get people not necessarily detracting from going to post-secondary education, but to say, this is a fantastic opportunity because well over 80% of the people that are in apprenticeship programs had no idea this opportunity was before them due to the fact that they were encouraged to go and seek post-secondary uh, post or higher education upon graduation from high school. So with that, again, Joe, thank you for the wonderful words this morning and the opportunity to speak and uh, look forward to the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Todd.
Thank you very much, Todd. We appreciate it. Your guidance is always um, right on point and helps us keep moving in the right direction. So thank you for uh, making some time to be with us today and to share those thoughts. Um, you know, folks have been listening to a lot of information over the past hour. I'm going to ask for your input. And what I'd like to do is get you to think and to share a little bit. We have a poll question I'd like to, to put up and get your, your feedback and your thoughts. So how many individuals are currently full-time registered apprentices in Connecticut across all industries? Got it. Answers starting to come in. We'll give it a few more seconds here. See some head scratching going on. For those of you who left your cameras on, thank you. All right, some switching happening now. So what do we have, Shannon? See, so it looks like 52% of the people got the correct answer. So it's 600, um, 6,285,000 6, people are currently registered apprentice. That is a good number across the state. You know, the apprenticeships are not possible without the um, ability to have the employers, but also a place for people to actually learn. And we're very fortunate in our area to have um, Derby High School that was mentioned earlier. <clears throat> They've had a number of summer programs that for the pre-apprenticeship level that have really helped people advance their careers. Cusatana Community College locally has a fantastic facility that just celebrated a 10 year anniversary uh, and other community colleges across the, street as, across the state as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, shine a little bit of a spotlight in the brief video here to introduce you to the Platte Tech High School. And we're going to get a virtual tour led by David Tuttle, who's the Department Head of Precision Machining Technology. And I think this one important thing about the video is it really changes the perception some might have about advanced, about manufacturing and the advanced manufacturing world, which is very modern, very clean, and uh, very reliant on technology. We're inside Platte Technical High School, which is part of the Connecticut Technical High School system. We're in a brand new facility. It's a $98 million school. Um, and inside this precision machining program, there was a huge investment in new technology and these machines behind it. Of a, uh, about $1.3 million to parallel all the equipment that you find out in the industry right now. So during the day we have a high school program for grades 9 through 12 and in the evenings this facility is a satellite facility for Houstonic Community College continuing education program and we will bring in adults at night um, through a three level CNC program three semesters. Level one primarily is um, entry level uh, for adults and in introducing them to the world of CNC. We do have quite a few that come out of the workplace and um, come in here and start the beginning of their training for possible careers. Typically, right near the end of the first semester, we all look to try to place them into their first job, and then once they're on the job working, they'll come back for levels two and three and continue to learn and build upon their initial education. Every one of our graduates, whether they're high school students graduating or the adults, have the opportunity to go out into entry-level careers, sign up to be an apprentice, and then earn their hours on the job towards earning their either a 6,000 hour um, journeyman apprenticeship in CNC or they can go to 8,000 in tool making. And there's many, many other apprenticeships that go along with that individual one. So um, that, uh, that's a natural pathway for uh, a lot of the graduates to take. So all of our students, whether they're high school students during the day or the adult students at night, um, will learn on the computer numerical controlled equipment that's behind me. And uh, we have um, 29 pieces of equipment here on top of manual machines as well. Good. So I really want to thank again um, 
Dave's time for helping us and putting that together. And he's been a fantastic partner and an advocate across the state for apprenticeships. Uh, at this next point, what I'd like to do is uh, we have a few employers with us today and invite them to join us and to, to be spotlighted here for a, a little bit of Q&A, which I think will enlighten us all. And uh, just going to go through a brief introductions. Jim Gilday, who Joe mentioned earlier, is the Director of Manufacturing at Bigelow T, and he's been there for the past 26 years. Bigelow is a family-owned business dedicated to producing a variety of fine quality teas, and the company is one of the nation's leading producers especially teas with more than 130 varieties. What I really like to notice is that in addition to his work at Bigelow, Jim volunteers his time with organizations like the BRBC here in Bridgeport and the Derby Board of Education. Derby High School, as mentioned earlier, has been instrumental in partnering with our pre-apprenticeship training programs. We also have Sean Adamless. He's a manufacturing engineer, technician, and apprenticeship lead for Coherent Corp in Monroe. Coherent is a global leader in engineered materials and optoelectrical components. It's a company that develops innovative products for industrial optical communications, military, life sciences, semiconductor equipment, and consumer markets. It's quite a broad reach. And additionally, we have Dave Chanko, who is our Vice President of Operation for Forberg Industries. Dave has quite an interesting path to where he is today. Uh, Forberg was founded in 1935. Um, but he started out as a machine operator with Deed Industries and worked his way up to quality assurance manager and supervisor of final operations. He left Bede after 13 years and was hired by Horberg as a quality manager where he was there for 20 years, or he was hired 20 years ago. Eventually, the sole owner of the company brought Dave and one other person on as a partner of the business, and that's where he got to his vice president of operations position today. So thank you all three for being here. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can spotlight each one of you. I had a, a couple questions, but what I'd like to do is just for uh, quick answers for the, the three of you um, as we're bringing you up is I was wondering if you could each briefly state what was the main reason your organization adopted an apprenticeship training model? And if it's just a, a brief response for each one. And maybe we'll start with Jim. Jim, we need to unmute you. There we go. Thank you. Uh, and the ability to attract uh, candidates uh, uh, from a workforce development perspective, then uh, also to create a standardized structured training program. So those would be the two key. Fantastic. And, and Sean? What was the main reason your organization started an apprenticeship training well, model? For us, it was more of we were having a hard time finding different talent out there. So we really wanted to bring in different um, apprentices, young people. We wanted to be able to train and kind of mold them into the way that the way we run things here. And we figured it would benefit both parties. So basically, it was just a lack of finding the, the proper talent out in the industry. And we figured if we bring in all these students, we can actually shape them the exact way we want them to. So. And I understand Dave is, is here. Dave, you could turn on your camera. We'll be able to spotlight you and bring you up forward. There I am. <laughs> all right, you're the boy. So Dave, while, we're, while you're bringing you up, what was the main reason your organization adopted the, the uh, apprenticeship training? Actually, um... Our, uh, we, we kind of backdoored into it. Uh, Quinn had actually applied uh, for a job that was posted, I think on uh, Indeed or something like that. And she, we, we found out later that she was part of this program. So we ended up getting involved uh, with the program, like I said, through a backdoor channel. Uh, and, oh, by the way, I think I should mention no poaching Quinn. <laughs> she works for Horberg. So for, for each one of you, what are the main um, roles or jobs that are being performed by the apprentices, apprentices that are with you? Jim, we'll start with you again. Here at Bigelow, uh, our, our main apprentices are either working on our high-speed teabag equipment 
or they are the uh, folks working. We've expanded the program, and and, and so we we also have apprentices who are um, doing the blending uh, jobs and the blending functions, which is taking the raw tea, the ingredients, and turning that into finished product. Those are our two main uh, roles right now. Thank you, Anna. Sean. Go right ahead. Yeah, so we um we have it spread out, you know, pretty expansive. I mean, we obviously do a lot of the CNC milling operations. We're very heavy in uh, surface grind and jig grinding, uh, EDM sinker, uh, wire EDM. Those are basically the five main departments, and we kind of just move them around as the program evolves. You know, when they need to get a certain amount of hours. So I would say we're we're very heavy on the the CNC milling, Haas, uh, Yazda. Uh, Mazak and also wire EDM and sinker. So, and Dave for yourself. Uh, actually, uh, for Quinn, she's pretty much had uh, the exposure of pretty much everything we do here. We're a small company. Uh, everybody wears many hats, so it, everybody goes to where the the need is. She's uh, run schematics. She's learning setup and uh, maintaining of centerless grinding machines. Uh, she does. Uh, she's really seems to have a knack in uh, uh, in some of our secondary operations. Uh, we have a uh, an NC surface grinder, um, and uh, she just continues to amaze everybody here. So. Um, Thank you all for answering that. The reason I wanted to ask that question is because even within a single industry, you can see that there are many different types of occupations and roles that apprenticeship apprentices can play and many different types of career paths. Uh, we had talked a little bit about partnerships and how important partnerships are. Uh, Jim, specifically to you, um, can you talk at all about uh, successful collaborations or partnerships that help make the apprenticeship possible at your location? Yeah, so first I would I I, I would tell you, and, and I see she's on uh, Sarah Lewis and, and and Jason Galassi for certain. The two of them have been been great partners. Um, um, really, uh, probably I wouldn't even call it equal partners. They're better uh, than me. So they were they were strong. And then and then Todd, I see Todd is on, and Todd Birch and Carrie Valenti from the state of Connecticut. And he is right. I mean, he, they're just really easy to work with. Matter of fact, Carrie's coming down tomorrow to register more apprentices. So I would say between Sarah, Jason, the workplace, Joe, uh, Department of Labor, uh, those, everyone just wants to make the program work. And it's been a great collaboration. Wonderful. You know, you mentioned Todd and in Todd's remarks, you mentioned how, you know, apprenticeship is a training model post-employment. And so, Sean, I was wondering, how does uh, apprenticeship fit into your overall training for your employees? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so when we, before we even got into the, before we even got into the apprenticeship program, we were immensely invested in just cross-training in general. I mean, when you first come into our production floor, you'll see we have a big spreadsheet, a matrix of every single employee that works in the company and basically what they're trained on at that time. So it, it fits in perfectly because when one apprenticeship apprentice is working in a certain department, we usually don't have two in the same area. So by the time they need to move to another department, we actually have no issue backfilling them. So I think a uh, a lot heavy, heavy on the cross training. Um, we can easily position them with another apprentice once they're ready to move on to the next phase of their apprenticeship. And uh, I think it just, it fits well with our system here. Uh, again, heavily on the cross training here. Fantastic. And, and Dave, I want to ask you, I know it might be too soon for this question, but I'll put it by you anyway, is um, how has the apprenticeship improved or impacted productivity for your organization? Uh, it has um, it has helped, like uh, just like the, the last gentleman said that you know the cross training uh, has been most effective. But having somebody come in that knows the basics that can uh, you can pretty much you know plug and play in, in, in some areas uh, to be able to loosen up a bottleneck uh, where certain where one department may end up getting uh, being behind. 
and being able to have somebody that's confident in their ability will say to use a micrometer or not afraid to run a machine, they can go up there and uh, contribute almost right away in, in some regards. Thank you. And then um, Jim, we were talking about getting your uh, apprenticeships up and running. I was wondering if you can recall a, a challenge that you may have encountered when you first started in the process and um, while you're creating the programs and how did you overcome that challenge? You know, I would tell you that the, the, the challenge is, is just getting started, right? Because, you know, uh, and rightfully so, right? The state of Connecticut wants to know what your training program is. How are you going to train uh, your employees? So I would tell you the biggest challenge is taking that first step. And uh, uh, some people may say, uh, oh, that, that may be too much or it's a lot of work because you do have to justify the training. I would tell you the hardest step, the biggest challenge was getting started. And how we overcame it was, again, just the amazing partnership we had have with the workplace. They really came in. They facilitated the process. They they really uh, almost held our hand through the process. And uh, um, and, and we're just great partners. So that, that was really the biggest challenge for us and how we overcame it. I'd like to ask one last question to all three of you just to wrap, wrap this up. Um, if you could go back in time, and give yourself one piece of advice to the point where you're starting your apprenticeship program. And this is in case there's an employer out there who might be interested. What piece of advice would you give yourself? Uh, I guess I'll start this one. Um, I, I would say to not focus so much on perfecting every single detail of the apprenticeship. Um, for, for me, when I first drew up, you know, our criteria, how we wanted it to flow for our company, I spent so much time trying to get every detail right, trying to make sure I had all the training hours, you know, where they needed to be. I, I would say that you, you don't necessarily need to do that because it's constantly evolving, especially as we advance as a company ourselves. So I would just get it started. And Carrie Valenti from the state is very good at helping with that. So, I mean, and Jason Galassi, um, We've had a lot of good people with helping us out. So just start it, just get it rolling. Yes, what do you think, Jim? You know what, I, I would actually uh, agree, truthfully. Uh, the biggest advice I would give myself, because uh, when you hear, hey, you have to create uh, a training program for every, you know, for every position that you're going to do, you know, it could be overwhelming. So I would agree, definitely agree. Just get started, just dig in, start, start the process, and then move along quicker than what you think. And uh, there's a lot of great partners to help you. And Dave, as you mentioned, you backed into this, so maybe your perspective might be a little bit different. But um, what, what would be that piece of advice? Um, not be, don't be afraid to jump in with it. It's 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 really flexible, um, I, you know, and the rewards are really far more than what you would think they would be. Well, I, I do appreciate the time that each of you are giving us. The employer perspective is essential to what we're trying to do, and um, so thank you very much. And we're just going to move on to the next segment here. Thank you for that great piece of information. What I'd like to do is we have um, another success story from uh, Chet Wildeman, and I'd just like to play that for you briefly, because again, hearing from the participants is so important. Uh, my name is Chet Wildeman, and I work at Preferred Precision in Shell. Uh, before the program, I was at High school, after high school, I took the uh, introduction to CNC classes at Derby. I, everybody's been helpful along the process, and it's been fun to meet everybody and see the, I guess, everybody else's experience. Basically, I learned the, the basics of the buttons on like the machine and how they work and how to read the programs that are in the machines. A very number oriented uh, field and if you're good at math or fidget a lot then it's a good trade too. 
work into. I'm hoping to eventually work at Sikorsky for aerospace parts. As you might see, Chet's a little soft-spoken, but the apprenticeship opportunity is really giving him a route to something bigger, something greater, and he is very excited about it. We're happy to be working with him. And uh, it's just for me when I see that as an example of really making a difference for somebody out there. What I'd like to do is ask you all one more question, get you thinking a little bit again as we're turning the corner here. And uh, we have another poll question I'd like to put up and get your thoughts and see what you think about apprenticeships in Connecticut. So this is data from 2021, but what percentage of apprentices in the state of Connecticut were under age 25? We often think that apprentices are only our youth. Got a few answers coming in. Not as many head scratchers this time. Tom, if I may for one second, please. Sure. I want to congratulate Chet uh, going through the introduction and manufacturing program at Derby High School. I've created a pre-apprenticeship with credits. Credits kind of like an AP. Everybody knows that an AP in a high school setting is supposed to offset the courses you take in college. What we've created through a pre-apprenticeship was an AP for an occupation. So Chet, by going through that introductory course, got 120 hours off his 2000 hour apprenticeship program. It was designed perfectly. I'm glad you highlighted him because we're really proud of him. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for adding that. Can I add something, Tom? Absolutely. Uh, our yard grant also um, covered his uh, tuition to go back to Platt Tech for additional uh, training in the level uh, two and three CNC course at Platt. So, just another incentive to uh, register as an apprentice to continue your learning. Fantastic, thank you, Jason, for that. So the answer here is, uh, I believe it's 40%, Shannon, if I recall correctly on this, that 40% of apprentices are under the age of 25. Uh, what's also interesting there then is 60% are between 25 and 54. So apprenticeships are not just for people in their early 20s, but people at all different stages of life and career. I uh, just wanna share that with you and keep that in mind as um, apprenticeships can be for everyone. What I'd like to do now is introduce a good friend of the workplace. Uh, Marsha Proto has been somebody we've been working with for, I wanna say it's over 10 years, 12 years through the Health Career Academy. Yeah. Um, Marsha is executive director for the Connecticut Center for Nursing Workforce. Uh, this organization is focuses on collaborations to ensure a highly educated, diverse, and sustainable nursing workforce is available to support the healthcare needs of Connecticut residents. I asked her to join us today with consideration for what might be possible. We have been focusing a lot on manufacturing, but if we broaden our horizons, what other types of apprenticeships could be in reach? And so Marsha, thank you so much for making a few minutes. You're muted. Hi, Tom and uh, group. It's been a pleasure to uh, have a collaboration with you for actually over 12 years now. And uh, boy, is that an old picture of me. But thank you for putting that <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, the sky's the limit for apprenticeships in nursing and allied health. Um, as many of you may know, um, I've had an eight year uh, horizon of trying to engage um, apprenticeships in the role of nursing. Um, my colleagues around the country, um, throughout uh, Kentucky, as well as New Jersey, have very successful uh, apprenticeship programs, as well as I was actually a consultant to the um, Health Impact, which is the state of California's uh, nursing and allied health workforce center in guiding them through the process of getting their organization um, approved for apprenticeship, especially for their rural access hospitals, which are so challenged with attracting employees. So in Connecticut, we have a wonderful opportunity to really engage in apprenticeship for nursing. Actually dating back to 2016, I worked with um, a few employers who ran a residency program. And a residency is what 
many of our hospitals offer to new nurses that they hire. And I actually went through a crosswalk of what the residency program entailed and compared that to the federal uh, apprenticeship criteria. And lo and behold, actually, the residency model exceeds much of what the federal apprenticeship requires for that onboarding of new employees. The beautiful thing about an apprenticeship, as I heard from um, our employers, is it's a wonderful way to attract employees because they want to know that they're going to have a soft land and truly have an effective and robust onboard. They're going to have continued professional development. And you can only imagine in nursing, we can't participate or offer one residency or onboard for each nurse. We have nurses who go into the operating room. It takes about a year for them to be proficient. And boy, I actually was just in the OR on Monday and had some knee surgery. I'm glad my nurse had a full orientation to that OR for a successful outcome for the surgery. Um, in addition, if you have a nurse going into critical care, they have a separate track, a formal um, uh, generic education, but very specific. Uh, to onboard that practitioner to not only be safe, but competent and confident when they're engaging with patients and family. So in 2016, unfortunately, we were unable to do a statewide lift of a best practice uh, apprenticeship residency. And our goal was actually to give this model to every single hospital so they too could adopt best practice to onboard their new nurses. The problem is it costs a lot of money to onboard a new nurse, just like it does for our other colleagues at Bigelow and our other manufacturing uh, organizations. And just to give you a little bit of what's happening with our nursing workforce and why it's imperative that we do give all of our hospitals, long-term care, home care, an opportunity for these robust onboarding is to really support retention. Just this last year, we collect data. We had 13,000 qualified applicants to become nursing students. Unfortunately, we only have 2,800 seats. So we only accept 21% of our qualified nursing students. And then as they go through, we do have some attrition. So we only graduate 2,200 nursing students every year. And we know just from our hospitals, they need 4,000 new nurses. And we also heard recently, especially through COVID, our retention used to be single digits. When a nurse came, they stayed. Now, excuse me, attrition, when a nurse came, they stayed. But now what's happening is we have upwards of 20% attrition within the first one or two years of a new nurse starting their role. So when you look at how many we have at the door, how many we can take, how many we graduate, how many we push off into employment, and then we have attrition of 20%, even at our most top hospitals, we really need to look at a standardized best practice apprenticeship that we can offer to all of our hospitals in the state of Connecticut. So even if they transfer between facilities, we're still having that brain power and those safe, competent, and confident practitioners. We also work with long-term care employers. And actually in 2018, a few of our board members ran long-term care settings, chief nursing officers, saying that their attrition was up at 33%. How can we adopt a wonderful, uh, robust uh, apprenticeship on board for our long-term care nurses? We created a proposal. We submitted it through the Civil Money Penalty Fund, which is a, a bunch of dollars under the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Unfortunately, we were not funded, but we still wanted to attempt it one more time. When the Office of Workforce Strategy was created and Kelly Marie Valeries was onboarded, she was talking about how can we stabilize our RN nursing workforce? Again, we went back to the apprenticeship residency model. Unfortunately, that wasn't adopted. And our last attempt was in 2022, where we submitted a proposal through Career Connect which was using ARPA dollars to support um, uh, individuals who were impacted by COVID as well as organizations to really uh, support a robust workforce. Um, but again, we were not funded. We will not be deterred. Um, we had a meeting with all of the deans and directors who meet under uh, my organization monthly and all the chief nursing officers who work at all the hospitals through the Connecticut Hospital Association. They are committed to really seeing how we can create a best practice. 
As you know, in healthcare, reimbursements limit how much money is available in the till. Nursing workforce development, although should be critical, isn't one of the top priorities in healthcare organizations. They do not have the capacity to stand up a robust program. And that's why they continually look to my organization to see if we could be the conveners, take some heat off of them by providing all that didactic and the coaching and mentoring, and then let the practice setting do what they do best. That hands-on working with the new hires to mold them so they can be safe, competent, and confident practitioners. Because just like I, and I know you, when you go into a healthcare organization, whether it's a doctor's office, hospitals, long-term care facilities, you want to make sure you have the best prepared and most effective providers. And that's what we're trying to do in the state of Connecticut. So um, we are here to um, be a convener and, and drive this forward. Um, in our applications that we've submitted, especially for long-term care, I had convened a group of about 40 um, leaders, not only in nursing and education in the state through COVID. And one of the big things that came out to stabilize the workforce was creating some type of residency or apprenticeship model that can be done virtually across the state because our long-term care facilities only hire a handful every year. They don't have the capacity and the professionals inside to do all the work. So the Workforce Center was going to be assembling a, a group of um, exemplar nurse educators to really support the process. So um, we know that there's still, what, $35 million of approved bonding money floating out there in the state of Connecticut for apprenticeship. And I think nursing and allied health would be optimal to really engage in this um, uh, process, learn from our colleagues in manufacturing and finance who have done this so successfully, really to bring this into healthcare. So uh, happy to be here, delighted to be a continued partner with the, work, uh, the workplace and all the great work that they've been doing throughout um, uh, really the past 15 years to bolster healthcare in Connecticut. Thank you. Marcia, thank you so much for making time and to share your thoughts on the uh, workforce stabilization within the healthcare industry. Obviously, across all industries, retention is a huge issue for keeping people on board at employer sites. And uh, everyone is facing attrition, as Joe Carbone mentioned earlier, as our grain workforce is coming on. So those are very important issues, and thank you for sharing them. Hey everyone, we're uh, a few minutes past 11. I appreciate you hanging with us. We're actually turning the final corner in our presentation. We started a few moments late, so if you can hang with us for just a moment, I'd like to turn it back to Louis Reyes to uh, help us get to the final bend here. Okay, thanks, Tom. And again, thanks everyone for joining us today. It's been uh, um, exciting and great to hear from everyone and so much uh, amazing stuff happening in the state of Connecticut. And we are fortunate to, to be a part of it. And, and we have an amazing team. This is my team. And I really appreciate all the, the I call them the, the key players. Okay, everyone is pushing the, the, the boulder. Okay, we started with a little snowball. Now we got a boulder and we're pushing it all in the same direction. And I appreciate all the great work they've done. Libby, Lorenzo, Alvin, Jason, Alexandra, James, and one note, Alexandra handles our IT uh, um, uh, initiative. So we're making incredible strides in the IT space and she's uh, done an incredible job. So everyone, again, I really appreciate what they've done. And um, and again, we're, we have recruited and I'm glad Marsha mentioned about healthcare because we're also making great inroads into that space as well. So well then guys, uh, again, uh, a big uh, thank you to my team and, and uh, you know, anything they can do, they please reach out to them and uh, always available and, and provide great help and input. So really appreciate, uh, um, you know, they, they um, collectively working to change people's lives and, and the people we serve. So exciting stuff. And, and I'm glad uh, they're a part of the team. So. A little, a little clap for them. Solo clap. But <laughs> so thank you, guys. Okay, and now I'd like to recognize, before I, I um, get to this, Rotate Aerospace um, hired Quinshawn McCoy. Quinshawn McCoy was, was a young man 
that went through my boot camp and an amazing young man, just amazing. His, his um, ideals and aspiration and things he wanted to do were just beyond what I've, uh, you know, ever encountered with a young man that, that uh, Bridgeport local. And um, I had great interaction with him and tried to guide him and all this, but he has done amazing work. And he interviewed at Rotary Aerospace and they hired him on the spot, on the spot. He was so impressive. And, and, and again, I, I've enjoyed his journey. And now he, he's sent me some text, but he's on his way. He's at, uh, currently taking courses at Housatonic Community College, and he eventually wants to become an engineer. So again, great stuff. And so I'd like to recognize uh, Rotea Aerospace for, you know, as a champion and give them this award. We will do this in person, but the uh, Registered uh, Apprenticeship Champion Award recognition for the commitment and contribution to registered apprenticeships in Southwestern Connecticut. So thank you very much, Rotea Aerospace. I hope you continue to add more, more of our great participants and um, the, the impact and difference you're making is, is really appreciated. And so thank you so much. And again, I'd like to give you a, an applause as well. So thank you so much. And, and uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. And I, and I want to thank all the employers uh, you know, that uh, we partner with and, and are, are changing lives and bringing on quality, skilled people. And we will continue to do our part to, you know, to uh, provide the best pipeline and the best skilled people we can, we can provide. And again, our impact is for career, not a job, but a career, as everyone stated previously. So great stuff. And again, thank you, uh, 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 Rotaire, for for what you've done and what you will continue to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Louie, appreciate that. And as Louie mentioned, we will do an on-site in-person presentation to Rotaire. We're looking forward to that. So please continue to follow social media and you'll see hopefully some video and picture from 